Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up today with a special selection which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to listen to. Today's selection comes from Noel Wiz. End of the album it's from. The theme from the album is Polyrhythms and this song concludes a three song arc about a guy who participated in a failed coup. The song we're looking at is The Fourth Color, from King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. This comes off of the album <laughs> called uh, Polygondwana Land, which I probably put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Let's dive into this and see what King Gizzard is bringing to the table today. So a 14 beat phrase, that put us in seven. Oh, I can also count it in nine though. The polyrhythm is definitely strong on this. Very fat bass in there, cool accents. Very psychedelic though. Especially with those vocals. The heartbeat on the bass kick. This rhythmic pattern on the vocals. Consistent. Very smart decision to reduce the layers for this part. So that is in 7-8, at least the bass line is doing 7-8. The double tracked vocals having just an air of discrepancy to it, very psychedelic. The hi-hat's giving us a 6-8 here. I notice we're doing this vocal part, but without the call and response, and that allows room for all these other instruments to show up as well. That was a really good display of how chaotic it would be with both parts, all the instrumentals with the call and response. Really great to cap the section off and smart to wait until then to introduce it.
So I'm going to assume these final three minutes are album material and that it helps conclude the album as a whole. I'll be surprised if any of this relates back to, to the song, that is. Okay. Yeah, I don't have much to say about the ending. The drone that we had from minute three and a half to like 515 means absolutely nothing to me. It's just silence that I think is supposed to act as a buffer between the main meat of the song and the album outro. The outro is interesting, though, because it takes polyrhythms in an interesting direction i don't know what the time signature was there at the end because the phrasing seemed to consistently change i would count a bar of eight and then a bar of seven and then a bar of eight and then a bar of five and then a bar of eight and then a bar of nine and then a bar of eight and a bar of five and so our phrase shifted from 16 beats to 14 beats to 18 beats and you know whatever the order was it made it really difficult to follow along. I could always find the beginning of a phrase, but I had no idea what the ending was going to look like or when it was going to appear. Sometimes it was earlier than I expected, sometimes later, but never in any consistent manner. I would almost bet that the entire ending is fully linear if you look at it from a time signature perspective. Although there is always the case that the shifting time feel that I was interpreting was a polyrhythm against a much larger consistent time signature. That would be kind of bonkers. I wouldn't put it past them, but that would be the only way that I could see it all working is if eventually, somewhere towards the end of the song, everything finally lines back up if you were counting in 4-4 from the very beginning, which means the phrases would not go along with the time signature, but that eventually the section itself would line up. That would be kind of bonkers, and again though, not something I would put past them. King Gizzard does some wild stuff, and that seems right up their alley. But again, none of that outro, I feel, has anything to do with the opening three minutes of the song so it's sort of just its own little segment here i wanted to talk about it because it is a cool little idea but i don't know how to interpret it against anything else i have to say about this song so i kind of view it as a totally different thing entirely to be redundant totally and entirely <laughs> uh so the beginning three minutes of the song, though, this is absolutely bonkers. And I get the feeling that this is what the requester wanted me to check out primarily. The back three minutes of this song are sort of just, it, it's the same track. I have to listen to all of it. But, oh, actually, one other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, why I feel the ending is so distant from the rest of the track, is that we also have timbre changes going on there. So instead of the highly polyrhythmic feel that we have in the first part, we have this temporal, uh, uh, what would you call it? The, the phrasing. There we go. We have, we have odd phrasing at the end rather than polymetric phrasing. 
Um, but also the timbres are different. The guitar is fuzzier and larger here. There's a bit more reverb on it. The bass is a bit fatter. The drums are more static, less polyrhythmic. There's a lot of elements in both the composition and the production in the final part of this song that just, it doesn't match up with everything that came before it. So, I mean, that's, that to me is why I feel it's so disparate from the rest of the track. Anyways, to the A section here, the, the main part of the song. The requester had said that the theme of the album is polyrhythms. <laughs> And I think even knowing that I was not ready for what this album was about to do to my ears. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, I was like, okay, I feel a 7-8 here. And I think it was the bass I had mentioned. And then I listened to something else like, oh, was, oh wait, 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 this is actually a 9-4. And then I listened to something else. And every time I switched to another instrument, totally different time signature. And that is absolutely bonkers one of the first things though even if i didn't know uh beforehand through context that i was getting into a heavily polyrhythmic idea one of the things that would identify it right off the bat is the fact that we have an odd rhythmic idea starting off in the guitars but eventually we hear it in the vocals as well that bum 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 which actually sounds rather static when I just say it in isolation, but when you have that drum beat behind it giving you the quarter notes, you can feel the syncopation of that rhythm and how it consistently gets off beat with that core quarter note rhythm. Whether that quarter note rhythm comes from a 6-4 or a 7-4 or a 9-4 time signature, you're still getting that consistent beat somewhere in the, uh, in the song. And that syncopated idea doesn't reset with the rest of the band. It goes on and on and on, and it takes a few repetitions. And by a few, I mean many <laughs> repetitions before that idea begins to line back up with the core rhythm. That is one of the most clearest ways, if you're listening to something and you're like, this idea just never syncs back up with everything else, probably working with polyrhythms. What I find most fascinating about this though is that that is just the most obvious example, but almost every instrument in here is doing that against another instrument. You take any two instruments in the five or so instruments that are here, six once we introduce more vocals, uh, you take any one instrument and pair it against another, you're gonna find polyrhythms. They are all over the place. It is incredibly dense from a purely rhythmic perspective, and I have to give them massive props for this. It is... I'm going to come at this from somebody who has written music like this. I find it to be really easy, at least from my background in music, to start a project and say, we're working with polyrhythms. This instrument's in five, this instrument is in seven, this instrument is, th is in three, uh, and then making some rhythms. I think it's really easy to have all these layers of complexity. What I think showcases their skill in this and what makes them masters of the composition style more so than just somebody who threw it all together is because it does work together. There are obvious rhythmic discrepancies in here, but never does the song reach a point where it falls apart. Everything ends up working. And that's what I find most impressive, especially if this entire 43-minute song, 43-minute uh, album across 10 songs does this consistently. If the theme of the album is really polyrhythms and every song explores that, yeah, that's really impressive if every track is as consistent as this one is. Because that's where the difficulty lies. To me, that's the difference between a novice uh, polymetric writer and a master polymetric writer is how well does everything sync up? Are you finding the ways that the different rhythms are going to sit in the pockets of other rhythms and complement them? 
And as you add more and more rhythms on top of each other, where are they all socketing into everybody's rhythms? Where are they emphasizing things together and then splitting apart? And how does all of that affect the perception of time and rhythm and flow within a song? It is very, very easy to put five different time signatures into a song and then end up with a song that feels like a jarbled mess that nobody can bob their head to. And yet King Gizzard did that and it's very easy to get into a flow to enjoy the groove of the track, right? one of the grooves, if nothing else. If you can bob your head and snap your finger in two different time signatures, go for it, man. You want to enjoy multiple grooves at one time? Do it. I, I can't. <laughs> I, I don't know how drummers can do this kind of stuff. It always blows my mind when we have... Uh, I don't know if it happened in here. Yeah, it did actually, because cymbals were different than bass kicks. So yeah, there are polymetric ideas within the drums, and that always blows my mind, because if I play drums, everything's together. <laughs> I, I can't do poly uh, rhythms. Uh, other than the himiola, the three against two, which I have showcased a few times on this channel. there's uh, That's like the only one for me. <laughs> Everything else just gets too complex, and it's just like, wow, this guy's doing that. And if you can do that when you jam out, that's fine. I am enjoying one time signature at a time. But uh, yeah, to circle this all back, that is why this is impressive to me. Not just that they did it, but that they did it well in a cohesive way that 8.3 million plays on their most popular song on here. It's also their longest. I'm going to assume it's also polyrhythmic. People enjoy this. And it's very easy to do something like this and end up with something esoteric and not very popular at all. And yeah, they they didn't. That's just fascinating. I also see that most of their songs are about three minutes long, which just further uh, solidifies my hypothesis that this is a three-minute song with an album closer tacked on to it because where else would you put the album closer but on the final song? <laughs> you, just, you, can't, you can't avoid that. <laughs> um, they did do things very intelligently, though, and I kind of touched on this in the song itself during the reaction, but it is very easy for things to get too complex in here, and when we began to introduce the echo, the call and response on the vocals, uh, we reduced the instrumentation there. We reduced the rhythmic complexity. We only had one polyrhythmic idea, which was the bass uh, kick underneath everything. The drums were giving us a pretty standard beat, and the guitars and bass were following one of the drum ideas. And so we reduced the rhythmic complexity a lot so that we could have this back and forth. We also made all the instruments rather quiet. The vocals were a bit more prominent in the mix, volume-wise, and given more of the spotlight. And that allowed our attention to kind of pay... Uh, give more attention to these two elements. They were panned separately, but they were also given more spotlight. So it's very easy to just listen to the two of them. And it is creating a lot of uh, complexity within the song. You'll notice, uh, as I mentioned, at the end of the song proper, you know, three and a half minutes in or whatever, we did introduce the polyrhythmic instrumentation with the back and forth vocals, and that was a hair bit too much for me. Very cluttered, very claustrophobic, but they only did it for about 15 or 20 seconds, a nice way, as I mentioned, to cap that section off to show all of this coming together. Uh, I think that ends up working very well and utilizing the two elements in isolation before smashing them together momentarily is a great way of building the song in ways that are congruent with itself so that it, it moves in directions that it needs to in order to showcase what it wants while also allowing the song to be listenable for the audience. It ends up being really great in that direction. Um, the last thing I think I want to touch on is just general sound here. I think they do a fantastic job at creating something that feels very psychedelic. Between the reverb on the guitar tone, the double tracking on the vocals that have just a little bit of inconsistencies to them where there's almost a double image going on um, with the vocals where it sounds like one vocalist but it 
It can't be one vocalist. There's, it's got. It sounds like two voices, but they're very close. I mean, they're identical in timbre. Note-wise, they're very close. Rhythmically, they're very close. But there's just a little bit that's off that you're like, ah, that's got to be two vocalists. But they're so they're like 99% together that it feels like one. And I think that type of imaging uh, absolutely feels psychedelic. It's it's the it's like a delay. Right. When you move your hands and like you get like a blur behind it and like whenever they uh, put psychedelic elements into a film, that's sort of what this double imaging feels like with the vocals. I think that works really well. Uh, as I mentioned, the guitar tone, the bass is super fat. I don't know why it reminds me of 70s bass tones. Um, and that immediately reminds me of psychedelic music for some reason. 60s and 70s bass tones are just synonymous with that feeling for whatever reason for me i don't know if that's pop culture i don't know if that's actually a truth to uh the way music was produced at the time but the bass without doing anything of interest feels like it fits the era they're working with um i think there's uh, was there an organ in here i don't think so yeah i don't think so so that wanted to fit in but the whole song just kind of feels psychedelic and the weird time signatures and shifting phrasing of this track um, and inability to really find where one is because everybody's one is at a different time, I think adds to the psychedelic element to it. And so we're using something that's very modernly progressive with the way that time's being manipulated here and something that is very retro uh, proggy with the production of everything and smashing it together and creating what I think is a perfect hybrid of retro and modern prog rock and something that still feels very psychedelic where uh, I kind of have like psych the, the the beginning of prog rock and the end of psych sort of like melt together for me and i think this does a fantastic job of utilizing all the elements of all these types of music to create something very psychedelic by playing around with time itself and evoking the atmospheres of psychedelic rock. It's just really great at merging all this, and it has to be intentional, understanding how all of these parts fit together, where they blend in the Venn diagram, where, you know, the little mark in between all three of these styles of music, uh, and how all of that can elevate the feeling of a psychedelic track. Uh, the call and response, too, that's a very... Uh, Pink Floyd kind of thing. So, I mean, like everything, every little choice in here feels hand-picked in order to elevate what the song is doing. Um, let's dive into some lyrics, see what's going on there, and see if we can't pair any of this back to the music and find some cool through points along both sides. All right, so uh, the psychedelic element is interesting here because when we think about psychedelic drugs it tends to be uh i've never taken them so i'm going off of like pop culture and what drug users have described and stuff like this um but it's it's um an altering or maybe a heightening of your five senses what I find really interesting here is that that's sort of presented here as well, but not in that perspective. It is about becoming more, though. There is a feeling of enlightenment in here, but it's not about, well, it is about a heightening of one of the senses, that sight. It's about somebody who can now see the fourth color. As it states, human eyes typically perceive red, green, and blue. But the fourth color, some sort of sub-blue, hyper-violet, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, especially not with light waves. But it's, it's this concept of being able to see more of reality. And what would that do to a person? It says that they rise up out of their body and become omnipresent. That they walk the streets wholly, born again can see new light. They can see through walls. They can see people's heat. Interestingly, to take it a bit further, maybe figuratively, says, I can see your terror. I think this speaks a little bit not just to their evolution, maybe some sort of uh, 
Uh, evolution's a good word, but also how other people might be treating them. They feel extra human, superhuman, maybe. Other people are going to be fearful of that. Humans are not great with change. They're really good at othering people. So yeah, somebody who can now see a fourth color and can take in more information of the world is certainly going to be othered. Um, but here's the interesting part. The requester had mentioned that the song is about somebody who participated in a failed coup. The song has nothing to do with that. If the album is conceptual in any way, maybe that story takes place earlier in the album. This song seems to do very, very little with that concept at all, though. In fact, if it wasn't brought up in the context, I would never have come to that conclusion or touched on the subject at all. But there is an idea of being puppeted. The song begins with a refrain that we will hear in the chorus a couple of times. It says, I believe the hyperbole. People have said exaggerated things and I believe it. This could be that they have been led into doing something, maybe led into finding this fourth color by an outer force. But it could also be that they didn't believe in people who might have found the fourth color previously. And now they are a believer. But during the verse, it says many fingers many minds and many eyeballs puppet my feet. Later on in verse 2, this is followed with the idea that I am not my body. I find this really interesting because we have the idea of uh, spiritual enlightenment. Right there at the beginning of verse 1, I mentioned it says rising up out of my body, having this out-of-body experience, uh, engaging with the spiritual self, but it's juxtaposed with the idea of being controlled and manipulated by many others. It talks about walking the streets right after he says that fingers, minds, and eyeballs puppet my feet. I am no longer in control of my body. I do what others command me to. And through this, I feel enlightened. And this is what leads me to have a figurative understanding that this is somebody who has been led astray. And that totally changes my perspective on the idea of seeing the fourth color. It could be because of the idea of leading of being in a failed coup could be about somebody who thinks they have found a new truth thinks they have found some conspiracies behind the world and is now smarter than the average person because they have this hidden information and they are now participating in these events not of their own will anymore they have been fed false information and believe that what they're doing is justified when it no longer is But it really is just those two lines, many fingers, minds, and eyes puppet my feet, and I am not my body, that tell me this. And they are such a small amount of the lyrics that I'm not sure if that is a hidden little key, what you're supposed to have to unlock the greater meaning of the song, or if I'm just reading into a very small amount of it. It does end, though, says, I am born again, and I see the light. I am analyzing information, and I am now a god. There is no self-reflection here at all, and if this is a narrator and not told, uh, told to us through the first person, which there are many sections here that, I mean, pretty much everything starts with I, so this is a first-person recount. It feels strange for them at one moment to say that, I'm being manipulated, and then at the end say I am a god. So I'm not entirely sure how to read this. Again, I feel like I might be grasping at straws a little bit. However, there is a an annotation on the instrumental part, which is the two-minute long ambient noise into our outro. It says that after our protagonist has gotten te tetrachromacy, 
the ability to see four colors. It says we have a minute and a half of faint noises, like a blurry voice, distant noises we can barely hear, and then chaos unravels. Our protagonist creates chaos as we hear painful screams of citizens as some heavy music is playing. This is not my interpretation of the back half of the track at all, though I do find it interesting and quite plausible. The narrator does say, now I am a god, then we have silence, and then noise. A different type of playing with time than the beginning of the song did. It is quite possible that with the extra context of the album, this is how it should be understood. And so the final part of the track, as I said, it felt uh, disparate from the beginning, could actually be seen as another chapter of this story. I don't know. There's also a vinyl only sentence statement that said at the very end of the song, it is just hello. That was not in my version, at least I didn't hear it. Did you hear it? Uh, and I'm kind of curious about that. Also, why is it vinyl only? You don't put bonus content on exclusive uh, media runs uh, if you think it's an important part of your your art. So that feels more like an Easter egg or a bonus element, but they also chose to include it somewhere. So what's the importance of it? Tying all this back to the song, as I mentioned, it is about, uh, well, the music's very psychedelic to me, rhythmically and atmospherically, and the song is about gaining new perception of the world. I think those work out really well, and I think it's also very cool to pair a color theme, seeing more colors with a temporal musical theme, having more time signatures. I think that's awesome. And you know what? I said there's like five polyrhythms, but if there's four in here to line up with the idea of seeing four colors, I think that would be fantastic. I don't know if that's true, but that seems like a little detail that King Gizzard would probably put into their music. So if anyone's done more research or more analysis on this track, whether it's your own personal analysis or maybe a YouTube video where they find, oh, there's only four polyrhythms in here. I need that information because I think that'd be awesome. Anyways, those are my thoughts. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizards, the fourth color. Let me know what you thought of this track. If there's anything that stood out to you, anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on, maybe you have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspectives on this song. Put all that stuff in the comments section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. Takes you here, you can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, though. We're going to continue on with our two-parters theme. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.